on this episode of the Oklahoma Breakdown with Hacker and Lehman, presented by Riverwind Casino. Portal season is here, and we discuss how it's affecting the Sooners. Then Oklahoma City Mayor David Holt joins us to discuss the upcoming vote for the downtown arena in OKC, and we finish up with our winners and losers of the week. Please download and subscribe to the podcast, rate it five stars, and write us a good review. Follow the show on Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, and YouTube. Just search Oklahoma Breakdown on any of those, and you'll find us. All right, our man Michael Hosty will kick this thing off. It's time for the Oklahoma Breakdown. It's a beautiful Wednesday, December 6th, and you're listening to the Oklahoma Breakdown with Hiker and Layman, presented by Riverwind Casino. Riverwind is Oklahoma City's premier casino experience, and there are so many reasons why Riverwind is consistently voted OKC's number one casino, but it all starts with their amazing variety of gaming thrills and excitement. Riverwind's beautiful award-winning environment plays host to more than 2,800 of the latest electronic games with a huge selection of table games, including Blackjack, Blackjack Match Roulette, and Teddy's favorite, Craps. No matter what your game, Riverwind has it in spades and hearts and to learn more about their gaming promotions and entertainment options in the month of december all you got to do is visit riverwind.com riverwind casino simply the best now we're actually recording this late on tuesday night ted my wife is dragging me to new york for a couple days so we had to record early i got no problem with that let's uh well there's plenty to talk about it's not like we're we're stretching for stuff we got all kinds of news that's breaking yeah, I'll be going to a Jonas Brothers concert in New Jersey. So let's go. I never been. I I I know we're gonna get to the transfer portal stuff, people. But I I've never been. My wife, they're like my wife's favorite band. I'm excited. She's so excited that I'm excited. And I like the Jonas Brothers. They got some bangers from the last couple do. albums. Now, I, it's always one of those things where I know the song. And then someone says it's Jonas Brothers, and I had no idea that that's who sang it, but I know all the songs, obviously. I thought that that was, they were no more. Incorrect. Back and better than ever. Like we splintered, and now we're back, huh? Okay. Yeah. I like it. Nice. So I'm excited. It's going to be fun. Can't wait I've never to been to New York in December other than the last time I was in New York in December was I was in college at the National Football Foundation stuff. So I'm pretty excited. Hmm. Very cool. Enjoy. OU News. Sorry about that, people. I apologize. We don't talk about our personal lives much on there. That was, I don't know why (laughs) I brought that up. I apologize. OU Football News. The portal giveth and the portal taketh. And currently it is only (laughs) taketh-ing. Right. So, guys, we already knew we're in the portal. Uh, DJ Graham. Tawi Walker, uh, Jason Llewellyn, but it drops Monday morning. Dylan Gabriel in the transfer portal, and there's there's a lot of different things to discuss with that situation. But first and foremost, really good football player, tremendous human being, was a fantastic representative of the University of Oklahoma will always be an OU Texas legend for what he did in this year's game with that, with that drive and just wishing him the best. Sounds like Oregon may be the favorite to land him. I guess USC is in the running, which would certainly be an interesting wrinkle, but I, I am wishing the absolute best for Dylan Gabriel. And I feel like that's how every OU fan feels. Yeah, no, I I agree hundred um, percent. Like I'm actually excited for him if he were to go to Oregon, um, if he were to go to USC. I that's that's I'm not ready to I'm not ready to to go down that path just yet. I don't even let's cross know. that bridge <laughs> when we come to it. If it if that bridge ends up existing, right? Uh, I think Oregon's. I mean, clearly. Um, good football team. They're they're also going to do well in the portal this year, whether Dylan Gabriel's, you know, going to Oregon or not. Um, their schedule next year is, uh, from my view, awesome. From their year, uh, their view, brutal. All right, but it's going to be really cool watching them play. That 
they've put together a really good team out there. I think it's an awesome spot for him. I really do. I, and I hope he goes there and he can what, make way more money playing quarterback at Oregon next year than he would make in the NFL. There's no doubt about that. And that is, I think that is something that people may not realize. I, I believe Dylan's, intention this entire season were to play this year and then go to, into the draft. And I think he was a little surprised by the feedback he got late in the season. Didn't get an invite to the senior bowl. And it doesn't sound like he liked what he was hearing as far as a draft prog- a draft projection for him. So that just, I, I think that changed his decision. And I'm with you. I think he can make some really good money playing yeah. quarterback for one more year. And then there's an NIL aspect to that, right? Making NIL money with a new fan base on top of it, a new fan base that will be fired up for him to arrive. But yeah, this is, this is a business decision. I, I looked it up. I thought, and, and maybe I'm underselling it a little bit, but I thought, okay, at the very best, what a fifth round draft pick. Probably. Yep. Jaron Hall was a fifth round pick last year out of BYU to Minnesota. He got $279,000 to sign. That was the only guaranteed money he got. Now there's his base salary for the year, but overall he signed a four year, $4.1 million deal. So when you just look at the economics of it, it kind of feels like a no brainer for Dylan Gabriel to play college football next year. If he can get even a decent deal, you know, a package, whatever you want to call it. Yeah. And I don't know what that is. I mean, if you listen to what some people throw out there, one, one and a half, two, I mean, if he makes a million dollars, I, and you walk into town, like, the number one draft pick overall, you know, it's like you walk in and here's your car deal and, you know, got your parking spot right out in front probably. And, you know, you're, you're the old veteran and you're going to have all the answers and be the leader of the team right out of the gate. I mean, what, how is, how is that a bad deal? Or you can go to the NFL where they're not going to invest near as much in you and, you know, frankly, it's going to be very difficult to to find your way on the field. I mean, with where he'd be drafted, you never know. I, I think he can play in the NFL. Um, I don't, I don't project him as being an NFL starter, other than, you know, something happening and he ends up in that job. And once that happens, you never know what could go down. But I, I'm excited for him. I think it's I think it's a great opportunity, and frankly, easy decision. Yeah, I hope he goes to Oregon. Yeah. I really don't want him to go. I, I don't want people to be torn because I feel like everyone, for the most part, loves Dylan Gabriel. Great leader about all the right stuff. I just, I don't want OU fans to have to deal with seeing him in a USC jersey. I, I mean, uh, money talks. Yeah, okay. no doubt. But, It's hard to, even if they have like a better deal put together than Oregon does, I, that's a hard move to make. I mean, he pulled, he pulled into campus in Norman, right in the heat of the hatred for USC. Right. And it's never really changed since then. Like, that's not an easy move to make. Like right or wrong, I you if you make that decision in in a sense you are saying I'm burning bridges with Oklahoma here whenever I whenever I go to USC. I mean that's and I don't think that's something he would do. Could be wrong. Ultimately, he's got to do what's best for himself. And if you can get a massive payment from USC and then get developed by Lincoln Riley. I mean, he's going to have the number one overall pick again at quarterback. It's going yeah, to be his third that, one. And that number one overall pick mustered up a, a really impressive, what was their record this year? 
Seven and five. Seven, seven and five, and was running around for his life the entire season. Or you take a look at what Bo Nix was doing. That looks a little more appealing. Yeah. No, I think Oregon's the easy <laughs> choice. Now we'll see how how it works out. But I, I think the the next question is okay. What's that mean for Oklahoma? Dylan Gabriel's in the portal. We're wishing him the best. Hopefully it's Oregon and not USC, but now it is it's Jackson Arnold's team. And he's got 15 practices to settle in as QB1. He's got 15 practices to work with Seth Luttrell and Joe John Finley, who are now the co-coordinators. Uh, and they have 15 practices to develop a game plan to go beat Arizona that will maximize Jackson Arnold's strengths. And while they're going to be focused on themselves for the most of bowl practice, right? And you, you, when you're practicing during bowl season, it's more fundamentals. Like you're working on you a lot of the time, and then you'll get into the game planning stuff for Arizona. But I, I just think it's really interesting that they can get that process started for next season now. Like, hey, let's start building this offense around Jackson Arnold. And it's a full spring ball. That's exactly what it is. Yeah. It's a full spring ball, 15 practices. And, you know, I, I, just to be able to, to get out there right away with your new offensive coordinators and start working on some stuff and like get a better picture of what his strengths and weaknesses are on some things and tinker with the game plan a little bit, which like you want to win that game. And I'm not suggesting it's not important, but I think, I figuring Jackson Arnold out and figuring out what type of football team you think you may want to be next year, which is another difficult thing because the roster is going to look totally different in spring ball than it looks right now. And in the season next year, obviously. So that can be difficult, but I mean, getting him out there 15 practices as the starter, as the guy that's getting starter coaching starters get, way more coaching than backups. Uh, the amount of coaching you get as the starters is totally different. And that's on the field. That's in meetings. That's everything. So getting him all of that good, that good coaching and, you know, just gearing him up for, for what next spring is like, I think is, is like very beneficial, beneficial for him in the program. Yeah. And you look at the, the quarterback situation as a whole, Clearly, very excited about Jackson Arnold and his future in the program. But then you start thinking about the QB depth. And, and that is, that's an interesting conversation. Now, you did get Michael Hawkins, who's the quarterback in that 2024 class. He reaffirmed his commitment. Kevin Sperry, uh, who's the quarterback in the 2025 class. He reaffirmed his commitment. Now, who knows? 2025, that feels forever away but it is I, I do wonder if the staff is looking at what that quarterback position is going to look like heading into the S sec next year you're going to have a true sophomore starting is your backup going to be a true freshman that's where you, you look at it and you go yeah you know that that's not an ideal situation as you venture into the best conference in all of college football so it will be interesting to see if they bring, you know, a veteran guy that is willing to take a backup role. I don't know if such a person exists, but if it does, come on down to Oklahoma, buddy. Let's go. Yeah. No, that's going to be interesting. They they really do need to solidify that position. They need numbers there. Um, let's face it, Jackson Arnold is an athletic guy that likes to make big plays and I envision him running the ball quite a bit. So I mean, you have to, you have to at least um, think about what, what does damage control look like? So you, you've got to try and solidify that with, with the backup quarterback in the transfer portal, but it's difficult. I mean, you're going to be asking a guy, Hey, we got a young one. We think he's going to be really good. We want you to come in, compete, push him. You got to, you got an opportunity at the job. If you can beat him out. You know, I mean, that's how you present it, and hopefully you get uh, 
get someone that competes, pushes Jackson Arnold, and ultimately turns into a really good backup quarterback. That would be an ideal scenario. Okay, other guys that have hopped into the portal, uh, Key Lawrence. Uh, I think it is, this is a guy that you and I, we've always loved his personality. He's a fun guy, fun guy to be around. Uh, made some nice plays during his his years at Oklahoma. No doubt had some rough moments. And I, I think it's pretty simple for Key when you look at the decision he's making here. It's, it's unlikely he was going to be a starter at safety for this team next year. When you think about RSJ, uh, I know Billy Bowman still got a decision to make, but Peyton Bowen, it just, I don't think if it were, if it weren't for injuries, he wouldn't have played as much as he did this season. So I think he probably just looked at the, the situation and said, Hey, I got, I got one more year of this. I need to go somewhere where I feel like I'm un- definitely going to be a starter. Yeah. Then I understand that. And I think, I think he's pretty good safety. I do. I um, think he's a solid football player. He's physical. He's got good size, good range to him. Um, and I do think, I depending on what happens at the position, but I do think that there's there's a chance we miss his the depth that he provides. Remember, yeah. he was playing corner against Texas uh, as as that game was unfolding and you know, he could come down, he could play the cheetah for you in a pinch. He could play both the safety spots. So, you know, he, he, he was a big part of our secondary and we're going to have to have a, a lot of young guys really come along to add to that depth. It's not just about who your starters are. You got to have some good pieces. I mean, I don't know how many different lineups we had in the secondary this year. I mean, think about it at corner and safety and in cheetah, it was, it was like a different matchup like by quarter throughout the entire season and by game quarter and game. I mean, it was, it's pretty wild. So we, we could miss his depth. No, I, I completely agree. And also just kind of a good vibes from that guy. Loud, uh, he, energetic, communicating. I liked it. He, he's the type of guy that can make practice more fun, you know, make the locker room more fun. So it, it's, it's always hard to tell, you know, from that standpoint, what the impact will be when a guy like that leaves, but other guys, Savion Bird, just never put it together, man. And I, I'm not sure the issues were physical. Now he he definitely he had he had difficulty getting his weight to where it needed to be. Right when you are a power five offensive guard, but. You know, just watching him at the start of the season and then having him just kind of disappear, it was, I think he just lost his confidence. Uh, the demeanor as the season went on, it just, it was strange. And if you are not confident, not only in yourself, but like what you're doing out on the field, Bill Beanbow's a really hard guy to play for if you don't have confidence in yourself and what you're doing, because he's going to demand a lot from you. And I, I just think as his confidence went down, I, I don't know, man, I, I am hoping he goes somewhere and plays well, but it just, it never worked out, which is disappointing. Cause I think he's a, I think he's a really physically gifted player. You think he'll catch on somewhere decent? I mean, I know it's hard to say. Yeah. All, all you got to do is send the film from the damn, what was it? The cheese it bowl? Yeah. Yeah. That's all you got to do is say, Hey, that guy, is that guy still in there? I, yeah. I just don't know where that guy went. We thought that was going to be some springboard for him and. That was the best football he played in an Oklahoma uniform. I agree. It got worse, which is, I mean, it's just strange, you know? Yeah. I don't know. Um, I know it was frustrating for him, frustrating um, to not see someone, you know, get the most out of, uh, out of their time here, but good luck to him wherever he goes. I mean, he, if, if he can go somewhere and, 
find a coach or a system or a, a place where he can bring that confidence back and play some good football, I'd love to see it. Nate Anderson, another offensive lineman, also hopped in the transfer portal. Just really highly recruited guy. Just never got to the level of consistency needed to earn playing time. But I've heard multiple members of the staff talk about like how strong he is and things. I've just never have seen it in his play, but you never know. When a guy is that highly recruited, I think he was he was close to being like a five star as an interior offensive lineman. I think he was our highest ranked recruit in was twenty nineteen or one of those years. I think he was either a highest or second highest ranked recruit. So he should I would assume he'll get a chance somewhere and I'm rooting for him. Yep. Uh Reggie Same. Grimes. Reggie Grimes in the transfer portal, another guy that, you know, wishing him the best. He was he was a great representative of OU in that 2022 season, but that was rough. And he just got passed up by other guys this season. And I don't know if anyone cares about my advice. I think he should get as heavy as he can get and go play three techniques somewhere. You know, you got to get the pads down. That's something we talked about with Reggie in the past. But I think the interior, like with his length, I think that would be, that's his best chance at a football future, in my opinion. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and I think a lot of these guys, you know, you, you can, you could take a step down in level um like just and i'm not saying d2 i'm saying like non-power five and find a little success and find some confidence and who knows where you can end up uh once you start playing with some good confidence and and some good belief behind you and i think reggie is one of those guys i mean him save you on bird i think those guys can go play kind of at that non-power five level at some places and probably be really good contributors. Marcus Major in the portal. He is, for me, because I was rooting like hell for that kid. He's from Oklahoma City, Millwood. And that's not far. Yeah, I played against Millwood in high school. Like I, I was rooting for him. In a big way, he is one of the biggest what if he would have stayed healthy cases for me since I started doing the OU stuff in 2018. The dude could just never stay healthy. And I feel like year after year after year, it set him back more and more and more from what he could be. And I think if, and that you could say this about a lot of guys, but if he would have been able to stay healthy, I think he would have been awesome. But yep. Just just never could, man. Bummer. Yeah, it's tough. Same thing with him, man. I, we've seen how good he is with the football in his hands. Um, if he could go somewhere, get healthy, stay healthy, um, you know, at a lower level, be the dude, he could probably have a super productive season somewhere. Completely agree. Now, the most surprising portal entry to me was Dalen Smothers. Now, he's from North Carolina. Does he want to get back somewhere closer to home? Remember, there's that thing during training camp. I, so maybe that is all still at play here. But this is a true freshman that was on the field in critical situations in Bethlehem. I, normally, you don't leave when you're playing important snaps as a true freshman somewhere. So I... I don't know. I don't know what's going on there, but I'm confident that the running back position at the University of Oklahoma is going to be better next season. I thought Dalen Smothers was going to be part of that, but apparently he's not. It's an interesting one, Ted. No, it is. I, You know, I it feels like one of frustration, but I don't know. It's just a guess. From my part, and I could I can understand that I 
if you're young, you feel like you, you're you're putting in your time, and frankly, you're watching some average running back play in front of you, and you feel like you deserve more of a shot, and you don't get it. Um, I could see how you would feel like maybe you're never going to get it, and you might as well take your losses and go find somewhere else to play early on instead of um, wasting another year. If that's what you think, I and I don't know enough about the relationship there and like his pra- practice habits and how he handles himself off the off the field. I don't know enough about that, but kind of feels that way a little bit. Um, but again, another talented kid. DeMarco I Murray. Hope guys find a home. You know, that's the thing is I hate when guys go to the transfer portal and, and never find a home again. Yeah. I I would assume I don't know, Smothers feels like a guy that hopped in the portal knowing where he would go. But yeah. I guess you never know. Uh, but it does make the running back situation for the Alamo Bowl pretty interesting. Sawchuck. Barnes, Caleb Hicks. Give me all the Caleb Hicks. I want to see all the Caleb Hicks. That guy looks amazing in a jersey. Sign me up. I agree, but was he even dressed out on the roster the last couple of games of the season? I don't even remember seeing him. I don't think he was out there. He's still on the roster. And he hasn't entered his name in the portal as of this recording. I... Dude, I don't know. One of those other guys decides to hop in the portal, and we got a running back problem in the Alamo Bowl. <laughs> Jaron Kanick, here we come, baby. Oh, you've been waiting for it. <laughs> you, you got anything else on any of the guys that have hopped in the portal? I think we speak for all OU fans. We wish those guys the best. Yeah. Unless they're playing against OU in the future. I mean, that's. But it is, and I'm not trying to sound harsh when I say it this way, but maybe it's best to ask you. You're more reasonable than I am, typically. Do you feel like there were any significant losses in the portal? Like anything that really concerns you? Outside of Dylan Gabriel, no. I I think everyone has, we all cooked in that he was either going to the NFL or going to the transfer portal. So. I know everyone's like Oklahoma exodus of players, Dylan Gabriel. Everyone around here knew that that was coming, right? So I, that's that's not a big deal. Uh, like I said, I think the only one for me that I hope isn't one that we're thinking about is Key Lawrence. Uh, good, solid depth, good player. Um, could have provided good experience in the secondary should you come into uh, an injury issue, which happens often. So that, I mean, to me, that's, that's kind of the only one. If I had to hand select a guy to be able to say, you're staying right here, I would pick Key Lawrence. That's fair. I, I think the only other OU thing to hit is Drake Stoops. I was really hoping he would win the Burlesworth trophy. I didn't know the Missouri running back was a walk-on. Cody Schrader, he wins it. Running back from Missouri. Guy led the SEC in rushing. He was a huge piece of that Missouri team having a great season. He's a really good player. I wanted him to give it to someone that I would just be enraged. I wanted Drake to win it real bad, but Schrader's... He's pretty qualified to win that award. What does it say about the SEC, the greatest conference in all of college football, that had a walk-on from Missouri lead the conference in rushing? You never know, man. Never would it, I, that. No one would have picked that, but great player. Congrats to him. Um, I'm sure very de- deserving, but Drake Stoops should have won it. Drake Stoops, yeah, I, we're going to go to bat for that guy each and every time. Him, even though he didn't win the award, and it would have been a perfect kind of cherry on top, not only to his career, but to the season he had, man. 
he was the most reliable player OU had this season. Him and Billy Bowman. Yep, hundred percent. He was just he was, and he got hurt on like the first play of the year. I forgot about that. That shoulder was not right like all season long. No, no, and he, he still had a career good. year. First team yeah. All Big Twelve. First team All Big Twelve, and has a chance to to have a thousand yards receiving if he has a big bowl game. What's he at? Like eight eighty something, hundred twenty yeah. yards, doable. If if I'm a young quarterback and I'm getting my first start, guess where I'm going with the ball over and over to the open guy in the slot 12. I hear you. All right, let's get to call your shot. We asked you guys the most important thing that happened for OU football this week. Uh, this first one comes from Bobby V who says Billy and Ethan pumping up PJ and Jackson Arnold, the future of OU football. Ted, you had a front seat to it. Ethan Downs yeah. and Billy Bowman at Rudy's. What did you think yeah. of what they said? It was awesome. Yeah, I, that was really cool. Ethan was great. Billy was great. Um, I can't believe yeah. you didn't pressure Billy into saying that he was coming back. What are you doing? Come on, man. Yeah, I I think he's a cool customer. He doesn't get rattled. I don't think he would have said much. You know, he's just been like, yeah, I'm going to think about it. I thought you were going to bust out like some CIA tactics on him. <laughs> trick him into saying he's coming back next season. I actually feel pretty good about him coming back. I do. Um, I think he can come back, win the Jim Thorpe Award, and be a early round draft pick. You know, I, I think that that's a possibility for him playing in the SEC. Um, I think that Ethan Downs was excellent, and hearing him talk about wanting to come back, he's got. He's got more improvement to do, and he feels it's his duty to to be a leader and, and help develop the young guys like PJ. I thought that was awesome. I'm with you. All right, this other one comes from Ron Hubble, who said the more the most important thing, Texas A&M D lines meltdown. We have to take advantage. What's going on there? I know I've heard names entering the portal. I know the big recruit. With the McKinley kid, uh, sounds like some people think maybe that's in question now. Walter Nolan, uh, yeah. the Overtons. I think a lot of people thought it was very interesting where Todd Bates was a couple days ago. Yeah. Uh, checking in on what David Hicks's dad's program, which yeah, I heard. He, uh, he was just there to talk about some some of the younger talent they have on that, that uh -huh. <laughs> yeah no, you know what that was that was smart that's what it was but yeah it it would be awfully nice if Oklahoma could go into the SEC next season with a defensive tackle or multiple bring them all with a with a few defensive tackles that when you walk out on the field you went oh okay Whoa. that guy all right like that's that's what we need man yeah and you you yeah. got to develop them out of high school but if you got to supplement that group by bringing in a couple of portal guys then so be it you you got to get the dudes though so. yeah and I don't. I have. I have nothing to add on where those guys may or may not go. What the rumor is, I have no idea. But I know that some big, strong, good-looking athletes there on the defensive line. And uh, last I checked, if my math is correct, and there's a good chance that it's not, I think eight guys on our defensive line, including edge guys, are going to be gone. So that's a significant amount. Now. Hey. I think we did a good job upgrading from year one of BV to year two. We need to have as big of an upgrade from year two to year three. I mean, think about Reggie Grimes was a starter, significant player, played a ton of snaps in year one, didn't play much at all in year two. I mean, that says, you know, it tells a lot about how much better we got on that group. Like we're going to have to have that same type of jump from this season to next. And if we want to compete, I, if, top of the sec yeah and when you think about what the linebacker position could look like that could make 
the interior defensive line and how and the level those guys are playing at even more important. Oh yeah. Cause you could be playing some really inexperienced backers. Stutzman's got a decision to make. And we he was our guest on the live podcast and I don't know anything, but I did not walk away from it going, that guy's definitely coming back. So right. I I don't know. Yeah. So it could be know. Kip Lewis, Canick, who, whoever. You could have some young, talented, but they're young. Be the there too. Yeah. So they're going to be in the portal at backer for sure. And that's if Stetsman stays or goes. Uh, but you're right. I mean, uh, a bad defensive line can make good linebackers look really bad. A great defensive line can make bad linebackers look really good. So, uh, you, we need those dudes up in front. I mean, for sure, 100%. We're going to change gears here. Okay. Massive vote next week, next Tuesday, in Oklahoma City regarding the new arena. Ooh. And we've got Mayor David Holt to explain why people should vote yes. But first... Love's Travel Stops is now offering a nationwide 10 cent per gallon discount on gas and auto diesel. Just download the Love's Connect app and scan your barcode at the prompt on screen and watch that price drop 10 cents per gallon. Across the country, the Love's Connect app unlocks exclusive deals can help any traveler plan their route or meal on the highway. So before you hit the road, be sure to download the Love's Connect app to save 10 cents per gallon and experience the country's best highway hospitality at Love's Travel Stops. Loves also has you covered if you forget your phone charger or headphones with their expanded mobile to go zone. And of course, don't forget to grab yourself some of that delicious Java Hummori. The land doctors have a 120 acre property for sale in East Norman, located just 10 miles or excuse me, 10 minutes from campus. This completely wooded property sits at the intersection of East 120th Street and Tecumseh Road. If you're looking for a quiet place to go spend some time in the outdoors, or a nice little hunting spot on the outskirts of town, this place is just for you. There are also development and business opportunities with this property. Call Colton Cole to schedule a private showing at 405-615-7645 or shoot him an email at colton at landdoctors.com. And celebrate with a Schooner All-American Ale, the official craft beer of OU Athletics from Coupe Works. Named after the iconic Sooner Schooner that races across Owen Field after an OU score, you can join in on the celebration with a nice cold beer from Coupe Ale Works. You can enjoy it at the Palace on the Prairie, at OU Athletics events, at the bar at the tailgate, and in the comfort of your own home. For more information on Schooner All-American Ale, visit SchoonerAle.com. Must be 21 to purchase. Please drink responsibly. Schooner All-American Ale, the taste of game day. All right, here's Oklahoma City Mayor David Holt. It is our pleasure to be joined by a man that was one of Times 100 next this year. Yeah, 100 of the rising stars on planet Earth, and he's one of them, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> Oklahoma City Mayor David Holt is in the house. Mayor Holt, how we doing, man? Thank you. I'm doing great. Thank you for asking. Uh, how are you guys? No complaints here. No <laughs> complaints here. Unless you want to talk college football playoff. I mean, we could we could. Oh. Find- Plans there work. if you'd yeah, like, but yeah, otherwise, great. <laughs> yeah, you, you've got enough stuff to worry about, man. Let's start here. Uh, a rather important vote on December 12th. How you feeling? I feel good. Um, you know, we've been polling this for a year, and really, I can speak with, you know, a high level of confidence that a strong majority of Oklahoma City residents want to approve this vote. They want to build a new arena. They want to keep the thunder here and the concerts and everything else that being a big league city has meant to our to our little corner of the world. Um, but like, you know, we got to go vote. And I mean, look, that's partly why I'm here tonight. It's just to make sure people know uh, that this is coming up. They have the date circled on their calendar. It's Tuesday, December 12th. It is, it is coming right up. And um, and everyone in Oklahoma City needs to come out and be heard. Um, you know, I'm probably speaking to an audience right now that gets it, um, but you know that's meaningless if you don't if you don't cast your vote. So that's that's the bottom line. But 
you know, let's go and obviously we'll, this interview is not going to be 45 seconds long. So let's talk about a few more aspects of it, but, but that's the bottom line is the game day is here. Yeah. Well, I, I think one of the biggest things that people are maybe wrestling with is why, why we need a new arena. What, what's, what's the problem with the one we have? Yeah, sure. Well, I mean, you know, there's various answers to that. But the reality is we have the smallest arena in the NBA by square footage. And I always add that. Nevertheless, people always seem to hear seating capacity. That is not the issue. The issue is square footage, which is actually in many ways more important because that's really where a modern user of a modern arena makes their money. You know, whether it's sports team or a concert promoter, the square footage defines your ability to have all that ancillary hospitality, deet, retail and dining um, that really drives revenue. So if your arena is not offering that opportunity, people don't want to have concerts there. They'd rather go somewhere else and they'd rather not play their sports ball there. Right. So they want to go. They're going to take this team to a city with a better arena in a bigger market. Um, you know, our first challenge is simply that we're such a small market. We're the 42nd largest market in the United States in a league that has 30 teams. So obviously, you know, we're always going to be uh, climbing uphill. But when you add on top of it such a small arena, it's really challenging. Also, you know, the arena is $200 million of investment now over its life. Um, that's real money to you and me, but that is uh, pretty small, small potatoes in, in the arena world. You know, the Clippers are about to move into a $2 billion arena. Um, you know, Dallas spent 2x what we spent uh, 20 years ago. I mean, their arena would probably cost $800 million today. So. We just never really had a true NBA arena, certainly not an upper echelon arena. But the bottom line is all of those things are coming to a head now because our lease expired. Um, and so you're at that moment where, you know, you're trying to extend a relationship. Um, and if what you're offering is a small market and the league's worst arena or maybe the, maybe the second worst arena, if you're being generous, um, you're not going to get a long term lease extension. And that's been the case here. The Thunder you know, are not going to sign a long-term lease to play in Oklahoma City in the arena that we have, um, and neither is any other NBA team. So we had to make this choice now. The time is right for it. Um, and the reality is, even though some people kind of feel like it was just yesterday that we opened this arena, it, it wasn't. It was 21 years ago, um, and, you know, most NBA arenas, uh, well, I guess you'd say all but one NBA arena is 31 years or younger. So given that this will take the better part of a decade to implement this plan, you know, we're going to have uh, an old NBA arena by the end of this, in addition to the other liabilities I already mentioned. So um, that's the challenge. That's why we need a new arena. And we're also seeing ourselves become less and less competitive in the regional concert market. I mean, any time that an act is going to a smaller market in our region, like Tulsa, to perform um, that's a failure of our arena, right? Like they, they, that makes no logical business sense. Why would they go to a smaller market? But they're doing it because our arena is just suboptimal. Um, but fortunately, we have an answer for all of this. You know, we've been able to come to an agreement with the Thunder that keeps the team here for basically 30 years, plus, you know, beyond 2050. Um, and we don't even have to raise taxes to do it. So it's kind of like such an incredible win-win um that i think it's a no-brainer obviously but there's a lots of aspects to it lots of education that has to happen and we've been doing that over the course of the last year or two um but i think we've we've gotten to a point where the people of oklahoma city are, are ready to move forward make this commitment secure our status as a big league city for another generation and then we can worry about other things but this has meant so much to us as a city and i think everybody knows that and it is at stake December 12th. I, I need everybody to have a sense of urgency. This is this is our shot um, to secure this city status as a big league city beyond 2050. We're not gonna, we're not likely to get another shot at it. When when you guys have gathered all the economic data that you've been able to gather, what what type of economic impact would this new arena have? On Oklahoma City, yeah. In many ways, it's it's about sustaining. You know, I do think we'll definitely see some growth, especially in the concert business, if we can get a new arena. But on the pro sports side, it's about sustaining what we have, right? And so, 
you know, economists have come up with the number that it's $590 million of annual economic impact to Oklahoma City uh, for having the thunder here and having the concerts that we have. Um, that's every single year, half a billion dollars. Uh, 3,000 jobs, they tie to that. And that's the direct imp economic impact. That's the stuff you can really measure when you look at what's happening at the arena, what's happening directly with the team, and then what's happening at restaurants and hotels and in the hospitality industry. Um, I often, though, point out there's like this whole other major category that's a little harder to quantify, but it's kind of the one we can all see with our own eyes. And it's just that intangible benefit that having uh, a big league team has meant to Oklahoma City. Our GDP has grown 62% over the last 15 years. We've city proper, we've moved from the 31st largest city to the 20th largest city. And everybody in Oklahoma City knows, anyone who's lived here for any length of time knows that from dining to arts to um, diversity, this city has experienced a sea change since 2008. And, and all of that comes with like moving into the upper echelon of American cities. But that status is not assured, especially when you're the 42nd largest market. So, um, but but I, I nobody talks to job creators or investors more than me. And especially if they're coming from outside our borders, uh, it is apparent to me on a daily basis that I wouldn't be having those conversations um, if we didn't have a major league sports team. It's your, it's your, your gateway um, to, to a whole new level of opportunity that we didn't enjoy for our first 100 years or so of our history. But everybody knows that these last 15 years have been an amazing renaissance for our community. And it is absolutely goes hand in hand with the Thunder's arrival. And even if you've never been to a basketball game and you could care less about that, it's affected every other aspect of life in Oklahoma City. So um, yeah, $590 million is the official number, but I always say it's so much more than that. It affects everything else um, and, and anybody with eyes and, and who has lived here for more than five minutes can see what a difference it's made. And we don't wanna lose that. You know, We don't wanna go back to being Amarillo. And uh, when you're kind of at the edge of this world that we entered 15 years ago, you you have that danger, and uh, and and that's why this is so important. That sounds like a hell of a campaign speech. <laughs> Don't go back to Amarillo. Uh, <laughs> is, is there is, is there? I, I know there's there's a little bit of a counter argument out there. You know, I saw the the statement put out. I think it was 20 of the uh, you know professors that that put put out a counter argument or or, or counter research is there any one or or handful of arguments that you've seen or heard that you'd like to be able to address that you think maybe the information's not right or there's oh, a absolutely. different way to look at it well there's a ton of misinformation in this and even that i saw that letter and you know god it was just one after the other of factual errors that are not not subjective not opinions there's just misinformation most of the people that I know of that signed that letter that you're referencing have made a career of fighting sports and fighting sports venues in cities. Um, and, you know, I've learned in this process that you have this sort of like cottage industry of sports haters that sort of parachute into your town whenever you think about making this investment in yourself. But, you know, the widely respected economists in Oklahoma City that people know, um, you know, who work in business or or work in um, you know, the, the study of economics in our community have all come out publicly validating all of this. And we use one of the most well-known, well-respected firms uh, in the nation to come up with the with the figures I just talked about of half a billion dollars of annual economic impact. So, yeah, I mean, like anything, there's like, OK, well, you've got your economists, we've got our economists, you know, everybody's going to have, um, you know, dueling arguments. My view, though, the, of the of the attacks that you've seen um, you know, people talk about, you know, the, the team contribution, they want more from the team. Well, who doesn't want more from the team? You know, like I, that's a, a silly thing in a sense. I mean, of course, we asked for and, and presented many different options, but ultimately I get, you know, how we ended up where we are, because first of all, we're the 42nd largest market and markets our size don't get big offers like they do in Detroit and San Francisco. And trying to compare us to those markets 
is is just not fair. It's certainly not real a realistic assessment of where we stand. You know, the markets in the NBA that are are our peers, like Memphis and New Orleans, got zero team contribution, right? So we got fifty million dollars. That's better than they got, and it's also fifty million dollars more than we've ever received before. And that's the other thing. It's a little quirky. Is like. You know, when did this expectation get set that other people are very likely to build our arena for us, right? We've been building our own arena for 100 years. This is the fourth proposed arena in Oklahoma City history, and the three previous arenas were built 100% with tax dollars. Um, we own it. The Thunder and anybody else are tenants in it. Um, the $50 million that they have offered as a donation is truly that. It's a donation. They don't get anything for it. They don't own it. Um, and they use the building 12 to 15 percent of the time. You know, I, I I always think like, well, if they're supposed to pay, like, why should I invoice Elton John? Should I invoice Paul McCartney? I mean, like, you know, why? What world do you expect all the users of your facility to pay for it? Again, I'm the mayor. I will take any donation anybody will give to the city coffers. But I also have to live in reality and I can't sell fantasy to people. You know, this is the deal we're likely to get in a market our size. And by the way, there is not as if there's a bunch of other NBA teams calling me offering more money, right? This is the deal on the table from the only team that has any interest in being in Oklahoma City. And the only reason they have any interest in being in Oklahoma City is that they are owned by Oklahoma City people. Um, but they're not going to own the team forever because that's just the way it works. Um, and eventually we're going to have to fight even more in the free market. Um, and that's why we need to get this lease nailed down with them. Um, and we need to take this deal because there's not going to be a better deal. Any deal after this is going to be worse if we even get an offer at all, um, because we're also competing, not just, you know, getting compared to our peers in the NBA is one thing, but we're really competing with the 18 larger metropolitan statistical areas that don't have a team, 18 larger metros that don't have a team right now. Most of them have better arenas than we currently have, and some of them have better arenas than we're even proposing, right? Seattle got their act together after losing this team, and they now have a billion-dollar arena, and they're the 14th largest market in the United States. The list of cities that don't have an NBA team, like Nashville and Las Vegas and Seattle and San Diego and Cincinnati and Jacksonville and Kansas City, is pretty terrifying, you know? And to think what would happen if this failed, and suddenly you're kind of in a bidding war, because that's what would happen. You know, you'd suddenly get you know, all these cities throwing in their offers, you'd have ownership groups from literally around the world, you know, from everyone from New York hedge funds to Russian oligarchs would be making offers, um, you know, for this team, especially considering our lease is about to completely expire. Um, you know, that's not a bidding war we can win. And, and, and so if you think you have some issues with this deal, I would say compare it not to a better deal, because that ain't happening. Compare it to the, the prospect of not having this team. So if your thought is, I'm going to banish this team to another market to show how I feel about this offer. Well, the team is going to move to a bigger market with the nicer arena and make more money. So you've really shown them, right? But we will lose out on $590 million of annual economic impact and all the other things that this team and our big league status has meant to us. So you've got to be a realist. You've got to be kind of calculating in this deal. Um, and you've got to understand where we stand and, and what we have to lose and what we have to gain. Um, so, you know, other arguments that, that I've heard, um, you know, I mean, obviously you have to make a decision. And that's the, probably the most reasonable thing um, that I respect is if somebody just says, you know, I get it. You're not wrong about all these things you said about the economic impact. But ultimately, like, it's just not a it's just not important to me. I think what I'd say to that is. I understand that maybe you want to do other things with that. Well, you think you want to do other things with that money. The problem is, you know, um, if if the tax is somehow managed, first of all, it's not like the tax is going to be used on homelessness if this fails, right? Then you, you still have to like move forward and get people convinced to, to work on those other issues and have another vote on it. But even if that were the case, um, it's not like the money's still just really sitting there. You know, when you lose $590 million out of the community every year, you're kind of seeing like an economic contraction that, that doesn't make the other things you want to do possible anymore. You know, I often ask people, if you care about the social issues in this community, you care about helping people at all socioeconomic levels, we're doing a lot of that right now. And we weren't doing that in 1985 or 1995. You know, what we're doing today is unprecedented in our city's history. And it's not a coincidence that it's happening now. It's again, 
another benefit of having this economic growth that we've seen. It is not as if, let's use Amarillo, let's beat up on Amarillo again. It's not as if Amarillo, <laughs> it's not as if Amarillo, um, you know, not having the this burden of having to uh, pay for an arena for a major league sports team is now using that money that they have to have the world's greatest social safety net, right? The reality is small towns and mid-sized cities just don't have the resources to do the stuff that we're doing right now. And we have those resources because the Thunder are here. So I always say, look, I'm the guy, I'm the architect of MAPS4. Like, I care a lot about that stuff. You know, I'm the guy that was passionately advocating just like this four years ago for, you know, uh, affordable housing for the homeless and uh, the Palomar Family Justice Center for victims domestic violence and mental health crisis centers and a civil rights center and all of that. Um, and that's why I'm voting yes on December 12th, because all of those opportunities go away with the economic impact leaving town as well. Um, so that's really important to me. I guess maybe the last thing is when people say, and this I consider to really be misinformation, when they say, um, well, this team isn't going anywhere. That's just delusion. And I think this is an audience and you are guys who understand the reality of the situation. You know, this team's lease expired earlier this year. We have three years left, and they only signed that extension to have this conversation, to hold this vote. Um, we know how we got this team. And you can't present yourself as the 42nd largest market with one of the worst arenas and expect to have a long-term viable future with the National Basketball Association. It is what it is. I can't tell you exactly how it'll all play out, but I know that in Seattle, they had all these warning signs along the way and they kept saying no and they kept saying no. And then one day they woke up and their team had been bought by a group of men from Oklahoma City. And basically at that point, the story was over. You're not, you don't get this like last chance after last chance after last chance um, to do what you have to do, especially in a market this size. This is our opportunity. It's an amazing opportunity. It was a miracle that we got the team in the first place. It's kind of, a, it'll be kind of a minor miracle to keep the team, but I really believe that this is a win-win when you consider how the deck is stacked against us, that we can do this. We've got the secure, you know, we've got the, the commitment from the team to stay for basically 30 more years and we can do it without raising taxes. That's why we, we've got to take this deal. I am, I am a firm believer that you just got to have some luck when it comes to timing in life. How much does it help that the Thunder are really good now? <laughs> I mean, you look at it, what, 13 and six as we record this? They're the two seed in the West, Mayor Holt. Like, how do you think what the team looks like right now factors into this vote? Well, it's funny how quickly this turns because um, I feel like we might have done, we might have come together when I first kind of rolled out this conversation about a year and a half ago. And at that time, the, the team was very much perceived as being mired in a rebuild. And certainly a lot of the sports commentary I remember very vividly at the time was, well, gosh, this is really a this is really bad timing. This is really a bad time to, to, to bring this up when the team is so bad. And here we are. It's just a year and a half later. And now everybody's like, wow, great timing. You know, the team is so good. <laughs> um so I, of course, I was, I have to be consistent. I was pretty adamant back then. Uh, you know, I said, look, you cannot cast a 30 year vote or make a 30 year decision based on the on court performance of this team right now. Right. They're going to go through many ups and downs over the next three decades. Um, so I have to, in a sense, say the same thing. But I am a realist. Uh, I get it that, like, you know, people are probably in a little better mood right now. They can more readily see the potential of this current team. They don't want to miss out on that. They don't want to see that. Uh, you know, that championship parade happened in another city four years from now. So, yeah, I get it. I think it does help. Um, but ultimately, you know, I want to be consistent that people are making a generational decision on December 12th for our city's future. And it's so much, obviously, it's it's about so much more than what's happening on the court. But, yeah, nobody's more thrilled than I am. And I'm sure you two join me as well with how great the team is right now. It's it's a lot of fun to watch. It is. It is. I I just, um, that's all great information. Could you walk us through quickly, logistically, what it looks like should the vote pass? When, where, how, like, how's all that going to work out? Yeah. Well, you know, we'll probably spend 2024 
uh, we'll be hammering out the final terms of the lease. You know, the Thunder have basically put the basic terms that matter most to everybody in the letter of intent that they signed and the council passed and then I signed. Um, but now we got to, you have to turn that into, you know, a, a legal document that's dozens of pages long. Um, and then also simultaneously, we'll probably be selecting a site. Um, you know, it's going to be downtown, as I've said many times, but, you know, we got to kind of nail down the specific location. Um, and there's, you know, more than one potential option. Um, and then we'll move into design, you know, which that's that's in and of itself probably a couple year process and construction will certainly be a couple year process. The letter of intent states um, that we all mutually agree we want to open this this arena in 2029. And that's actually pretty aggressive, right? Because I happen to know historically that there was about 10 years for every one of our previous three arenas between the vote and the opening. Um, and we we would be trying to pull it off in about you know six or seven. So we'll see how it goes. But that's that's that was a necessary condition to secure this agreement with the Thunder. Um, and that also means because the tax won't take effect uh, until 2028, that we'll do a little bit of short-term borrowing. But all of that is covered within the tax. That won't come from any other source than the tax itself. Um, but the tax will start collecting in 2028 and the reason for that is that it's going to take the place of the maps for tax when the maps for tax fully runs its course and that's why it's not a tax increase um and that's kind of the i think that's responsive to your question that's sort of the the tick tock of the months and years ahead it's uh in a sense you know like the political issue will be settled and that is very difficult um but there's still a lot of work that remains one thing that i've heard many people and I think maybe it's just the emotional attachment to the building itself with the the history of the team up to this point. Do you know what would happen to what is now Paycom Center, what used to be the Ford Center? Do you know what used to be Chesapeake? Like, do you know what would happen to that building once the arena is done? No. You know, what I tell people is that's the last domino to fall in all of this, you know, that when Paycom becomes our second arena. And it's kind of best to keep an open mind for a little bit longer and, you know, just kind of let that play out. You know, if you'd been asking my predecessor, Mayor Cornette, 10 years ago, um, what would happen to the Cox Center, which was our convention center at the time, um, you know, when it was replaced, I guarantee you he wouldn't have told you, I think it'll be a film studio, but that's what it is today, right? So it's like, you know, keep an open mind about the future um whether it, whether it has a, a, a different purpose whether it's run as a second arena or whether it simply you know becomes the site of a future development of some kind i think all those things have to stay on the table for a while and it's best not to try to to jump ahead to decisions but let them be made when they should be made so I, we don't know we truly don't know is the answer but i think that's the appropriate answer at this stage it's best to kind of let things play out and to get closer to that time when when we really have to make a decision about paycom's future december 12th i mean that's that's the big day i mean i i i'm looking forward to it i think it's exciting times um you know i i think it's easy to see what downtown i you don't have to look very far back to see what it looked like previous and you know it's uh i think it's an amazing opportunity yeah here's the bottom line like, there's really a very simple question on the ballot on Tuesday, December 12th. Is, do you want to be big league or not? Do you want to have an NBA team or not? Do you want to have all these concerts or not? Um, you know, all those details matter, and that's what we're elected or appointed to do and worry about. But, you know, keep your eye on the big picture, you know? Like, I, I had somebody the other day, like, tweet at me, like, well, if I don't know where the site location is, you know, that's a real big issue for me. I, I may have to vote no. And I'm like, really? Like, you know, like, you really... <laughs> <laughs> like you really thought that through like you're not you're going to let the thunder leave town because you haven't figured out where the site is going to be you know i like that's i i know that humans are capable of that right like there's freight that's why we have cliches like not seeing the forest for the trees or whatever i get it that that's human nature but like i'm asking people keep your eye on the big picture there's a reason that the slogan of this campaign is keep okc big league because that's the real issue uh on the table that's where we got to keep our focus and um, so so as long as people stay focused on what really matters here and what is at stake and have a sense of urgency and take it seriously and get out to vote, don't just let, you know, 
the polls speak for us because they don't count. We got to get out there and show how we really feel. And I don't just want to win. I want to run up the numbers because I want to show the country uh, that we're serious, that we that we are we have emerged as a top 20 city and we have every intention of staying there. You know, um, you guys may know Malcolm Gladwell. You know, he's a very. Oh, I heard what he said. You heard what he said. Yeah. It's like to me, like, so, so for your listeners, you know, like a few weeks ago, he went on Bill Simmons and he said, basically, he said, well, I'm looking at Oklahoma City's population. I don't really, I don't really think they should even have a team. That's a consensus view everywhere but Oklahoma City, you know, and I, I obviously, you know, uh, bristle at that. Um, and so I don't just want to get 51%, you know, I want to, I want to really show this world and this country that Oklahoma City is is determined to keep investing in ourselves. We're determined to keep being a big league city. So um, I just encourage people to get out. And maybe on that note, if I can leave you with a few practical comments, um, you know, you can vote early Thursday and Friday at the county election board. And then, of course, on election day itself, Tuesday, December 12th, polls are open as always from 7 a.m. to 7 p.m. As long as you're in line, it's a, I don't necessarily expect lines, but but if as long as you're standing there at seven, they, they will let you vote. Um, and please remember that everybody who's registered in Oklahoma City can vote, regardless of political party. Um, and also a really important factor here, there's a lot of people who live in parts of Oklahoma City that have zip codes or school districts that share a name with a neighboring community. And so they often think they live in Edmond or Moore or Yukon when they really live in Oklahoma City. And I think some of our best supporters for this initiative are in those areas. So I really, I really uh, try to remind people, um, you know, check to verify where you really live, because anyone who lives in Oklahoma City, regardless of your zip code um, or your school district, can vote in this election. And so, one of the best tells is to go look at your trash can. If your trash can says Oklahoma City, you live in Oklahoma City. If you want to tell people you live in Edmond, that's between you and them. But, but on election day. <laughs> If your trash can says Oklahoma City, you live in Oklahoma City, please vote. We need your support. Um, don't take it for granted. We don't want anybody to wake up on December 13th with regret while 18 mayors and ownership groups are all swooping in uh, because they see blood in the water. And, and we're trying you know, to scramble and try to figure out what our future is going to look like. Let's avoid all that. Um, and let's get ahead of it. Let's make a strong statement. Let's pass this. Let's stay a big league city so you and I can keep talking about what's going on on the court for years to come. Well, I know it's going to be a busy week, Mr. Mayor, but I think we're going to be celebrating next Tuesday night. <laughs> Best of luck uh, in as someone that was born and raised and you know lives in Oklahoma City now. I appreciate everything you're doing, the effort that you and your team are putting forth to get this thing passed because the thunder has become one of the most important things in my life. And I I think I, I think a lot of people in Oklahoma City, sports people at least, feel the same way. So I'm I'm confident, man, but I like it. Let we want this thing to be a landslide. I love what you said. <laughs> Run the numbers up. Let's go. Hey, you know, when I ran for mayor, I called Barry Switzer and asked for his endorsement. And he, he gave he delivered to me his famous line. It was like, you know, talking to Bill, Bruce Willis and he says, yippee ki -yay or something, right? Barry Switzer said to me on the phone, let's hang half a hundred on him. And what I loved about that is that is actually, you know, what you need to win an election is, in fact, half a hundred. So, so, yes, let's 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 do more than that, obviously, in this case. But um, let's hang half a hundred on him and let's keep our thunder. Appreciate you. Thanks for the time, Mayor. Yeah, thank you, guys. Have a great night. The landslide's coming. It's coming, baby. Come on. Come on, Oklahoma City. In all seriousness, maybe my favorite thing about the Thunder is how it brings the state together. You know, growing up here, there, it was Oklahoma State and Oklahoma people, and there was that divide. And people that I used to just argue with all the time about sports constantly because it was crimson and cream versus the orange of black i now talk to weekly about the thunder and i love that i love how it's brought this state together and i do not want that to go away i don't want it to go away so vote yeah. yes
Yeah, and you know, I I get the I get the I understand the questions out there about it. You know, it's a big price tag. I understand, um, but I thought Mayor Holt did a really good job of of laying out the the solid reasoning behind it, and they could be big. I mean, the implications of losing the Thunder are massive. We don't I would go cry, legitimately cry. <laughs> don't make me cry, please. <laughs> All right, let's finish up with our winners and losers of the week. But first, John Vance Auto Group has a deal for Oklahoma Breakdown listeners. Go to any of their nine full-service dealerships in Woodward, Miami, and Guthrie. Tell them we sent you, and they'll give you $500 off. That's $500 off just because you listen to this podcast. They've been serving Oklahomans for 40 years, family-owned and operated, no matter what your vehicle needs are. John Vance Auto Group has you covered. They carry domestic brands such as Ford. Lincoln, Chevy, Buick, GMC, Chrysler, Dodge, Ram, Jeep, and Wagoneer. John Vance Auto Group's goal is to give unequaled service and to exceed customers' expectations in every way. You can find all the information about their lifetime loyalty program, browse their entire inventory, and find the John Vance dealership near you at vanceautogroup.com. And attention business owners, you need Insurica in your life. Insurica is one of the country's largest insurance brokers with 30 offices throughout Oklahoma, Texas, and the Southwest. Insurica is able to customize programs by accessing the latest information from many insurance carriers. They compare and contrast coverage offerings and pricing in order to design a cost-effective comprehensive program to meet your business's specific needs. If your business partners with Insurica, you'll save huge amounts of money and take back control of your total cost of risk. If your business wants to be best in class, connect with Insurica at Insurica.com. That's I-N-S-U-R-I-C-A.com. And head to the garage for hand-smashed patties, butter-toasted buns, and ice-cold beer. It's the perfect spot to watch any big game. And with all the garage locations being open to 10 p.m. or later every night, it's the go-to late-night spot. Visit eatatthegarage.com to find a location near you and order online from the garage in your neighborhood. And I know you just heard from Mayor Holt, but on December 12th, we can secure OKC as a big league city through 2050 and beyond by voting yes for a new arena. The Thunder has agreed to sign a lease through that date, and we can improve the fan experience all without a tax increase. When you vote, think about the thousands of jobs that depend on the activity at the arena, those working at restaurants, hotels, and all across our city. Vote yes on Tuesday, December 12th, authorized and paid for by Keep OKC Big League 2023. As always, Ted, kick us off. Who do you have as your winner of the week? Oh, you men's hoops. Dude. What a win. I mean, Providence is, is that's a good basketball team. And they straight up took it to them. What was it? 72 it was a file, 72 59, something like that. 72 51, sir. 51. Scoring some points. Athletic. McCollum looked great. Um, I. I was worried we were getting over our skis with where they were ranked. What were they up to like 19 in the, in the top 25? I was like, really? Are we, are we getting us ahead of ourselves here? Huge win. And we got a, we got a couple of other big games coming up where we got Arkansas coming up. We got UNC coming up. We got some big opportunities for this basketball team. I'm stoked, man. They're a fun watch. That Arkansas game at the BOK center. Is gonna be that thing's gonna be rocking. Yeah. But I loved how fast they started and Providence came back, right? Even took the lead, but the finish. No doubt. They they stuffed them in the locker in the last what seven or eight minutes of that game. Just yeah. completely dominated. Did you see what Providence coach said? No, I did not. Kim English, when he was talking about McCollum, quote. He looks like Allen Iverson out there. Woo. Now, I that may be a bridge too far for me, but he looks great. I mean, he looks he looks like he can. He's a do everything scorer. Uh, get to the hoop, shoot. Man, he's fun to watch. He's entertaining. I mean, to me, that's. I I don't know how good this team is basketball not my thing um but they are the most entertaining team that we've had in a really long time 
athletic, up and down the floor, could shoot, could get to the rim. We've seen some incredible dunks from these guys. Like to me, that's that's the coolest thing is that this is a fun group to watch. 70, 17 and twelve for you, San. That guy's fun to watch. The size, the athlete, like the length and the athleticism is it's just so much different than the last couple of years. We've been so far behind everyone that we've played. Like, I mean, in, in conference, like it's is drastic week by week. It's like we just don't have the length and athleticism. Well, last year, and it's it's not far off from us firing up football guys talking basketball here pretty soon, by the way. <laughs> I know. I it's know. gonna the, the return is coming, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, no. So you're it's gonna get cyclical and we're we're getting there. Yeah, you're gonna get all of our hoops analysis of this bad boy, but I feel like the conversation around OU basketball that you and I had over and over and over again was, hey, if they shoot the three well, they're going to be in it. If they don't, it's going to be a long game. Mm -hmm. Because they just didn't have the athletes to really compete like it at the rim. And yeah. that is not the case this year. They, they're, they're not built like Kansas, don't get me wrong, but they got some athletic dudes that can play some ball, man. And I am this, I'm with you. This is the most excited I've been to watch OU basketball in a long time. I made everyone sit around the TV. I was like, we're watching OU hoops. And my two-year-old was like, we're, Thunder? I said, no, 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 Sooners. And he was like, okay, Sooners. <laughs> and I, he sat there and watched. He liked what he saw. I was, I was fired up, man. That's cool. Yeah, that's fun, man. I'm excited for this group. Anything else? Nope. I'm happy for Porter. I know. I'm happy it was for rough, him. Man, it was rough. COVID. He's had to like recycle a oh, an entirely new team every year. It's been brutal. We need we need to get him on the pod here in these next couple of weeks. Yeah. Because I feel like he'll be in a good mood. And that'll yep. be fun. Yeah. So I we'll, agree. we'll reach out to the OU hoops people. We'll we'll try to make that happen for you guys. All right. Who do you have as your loser of the week? I <laughs> College football playoff, ESPN, I don't know. Um, Florida Governor Ron DeSantis has uh, carved out a cool little million bucks out of the, uh, the Florida budget just in case uh, the Board of Governors wants to uh, seek some legal action against, I don't know exactly who, uh, but it's going to be there for them should they want it. Um, says that Florida State lost out on $6 million, um, should have had an opportunity to play, and here's a million dollars. Should uh, should anyone want to investigate what went on? A little discovery, shall we? I, I love when politicians get involved. It's <laughs> no. the best. I, we should have asked Mayor Holt, what, would you rally the leaders here in the state of Oklahoma if OU would have gotten left out? of the playoff in, in such situation. I hope he would say yes. Of course he I, would. Nothing's going to come of this, but some voters in Tallahassee may remember at some point, they'd be like, Hey, remember when DeSantis gave us a million bucks just in case we wanted to go after the committee. I like that guy. Hey, you got to strike while the iron's hot. No doubt. Dude, there's nothing better than a pissed off, uh, um, constituency and if you can if you can find yourself in a way to to generate some of that uh and get the backing behind you you take it uh yeah i have no idea how that could ever uh I, how that moves forward but i know this people get real nervous all of a sudden whenever you start saying let's take a look at those emails Let's take a look at discovery and see what you guys were talking about leading up to this vote. You know, that, that always gets people a little bit curious, especially like when you could never imagine a lawsuit, right? It's like the last thing anyone would have ever thought of. So I don't know. I think it's at least, it's at least interesting to think about uncovering some big conspiracy theory for ratings for ESPN. Uh, man, I, it was pretty funny, but. You're right. It won't go anywhere. Maybe the best part about it was clearly DeSantis is doing it to 
gain favor from his constituents, which that's politics, right? Mm -hmm. But did you see what Trump put out on his social media thing? Uh, no. uh -uh. He said, I got it right here. Florida State was treated very, bad, very badly by the committee. They become the first Power 5 team to be left out of the college football playoffs. Really bad lobbying effort. Let's blame De Sanctimonious. <laughs> so he turned it on him. Oh. Uh, I don't uh, I don't really. Politics are not it. my thing, but just wildly entertaining sometimes when politics gets involved in sports. Wildly entertaining. <laughs> couldn't have been the committee. Couldn't have been uh couldn't have been the system. Couldn't have been anything. It had to have been that damn uh, DeSantis not lobbying <laughs> enough for Florida State. <laughs> DeSanctimonious. Oh, gosh, man. That's funny. But yeah, nothing's going to come to that. But it is, it's always fun to talk about. And I'm not going to lie. I'd like to see the emails. I guarantee you. Like, I'm not saying that there's some conspiracy theory there about who to vote for and who not to vote for. But I guarantee you, someone saw that heard of it and was like oh my god what are what did i say that when we were laughing and emailing back it's it's just kind of funny to think about i mean maybe it's not funny but um there's there's sure to be some people puckered up a little bit there's probably one class clown of the committee that's like oh i kill it on the email chain that's going oh no <laughs> <laughs> like sending memes and like so like he, the, there, there's one guy that thinks he's the funny guy in the email chain so i yeah i think there's one guy that's sweat that's that's just hilarious to think about oh i know it i know it all right let's get to my winner and loser but first Elevate your tailgate with Chapel Supply and Equipment. Oklahoma City Chapel Supply and Equipment has generators and inverters on hand that'll give you all the power you need so you can take your tailgate to the next level. They've also got top-of-the-line heaters to keep you warm during those cold tailgates later in the season. Oklahoma owned and operated. Elevate your tailgate by calling 405-495-1722 or visit chapelsupply.com. That's C-H-A-P-P-E-L-L supply.com. And First Fidelity Bank knows how to keep fans like you happy. With more than 50 awards in the last five years, including Forbes Best in State Bank, the Oklahomans Community Choice Awards, and the Journal Records Reader Rankings, it is clear that they are Oklahoma's number one pick for quality banking. And you can find that level of outstanding service in everything FFB offers. Open an account at an award-winning bank today at ffb.com. First Fidelity Bank, we go where you go. Bishop McGinnis Catholic High School represents a tradition of educational excellence in Oklahoma City. Grounded in a faith-based education, Bishop McGinnis offers a college prep curriculum that includes 22 AP courses, participation in OSS, AA athletics, and numerous clubs and organizations for students to join and grow. If you want to provide the best possible educational and spiritual development for your children, contact Bishop McGinnis Catholic High School or visit bmchs.org. Financial aid is available. And head to opolisclothing.com for our podcast merchandise and the best OU gear out there. That's O-P-O-L-I-S clothing.com and use promo code TED, T-E-D, for 10% off. That's opolisclothing.com and use promo code TED for 10% off. Buttery soft and 10% off. For my winner of the week, NCAA President Charlie Baker, I think. We are interesting. interesting is the perfect word. We are, we have been very critical of the NCA uh, during the, during the history of this podcast and they deserve it mostly. But according to Yahoo's Ross Dellinger, and there's a bunch of other reporting on this now, NCA president Charlie Baker is planning to quote, introduce a proposal this week to create a new subdivision with division one that grants certain schools more autonomy around policymaking and permits them, permits them to compensate athletes in a new and profound way. So schools can opt in or opt out into this new subdivision uh, that would still be under the NCA umbrella. And then 
according to the proposal, schools in the new subdivision could make NIL deals with their own athletes, which they currently can't do. Uh, they could directly compensate their athletes through a trust fund. They would be required to distribute thousands of dollars in additional educationally related funds without limits. The new subdivision could set scholarship limits, uh, accountable coaches limits. I would, I would assume they could determine how they want to operate when it comes to the portal. Ted, this is interesting, man. I don't, I don't know where this is going, but it feels like the start of something big to me. Very big. Yeah, I agree. Um, uh, it's basically, it's a, it's a different subdivision that's allowed to, in some degrees, govern themselves and kind of set, set it up how they uh, think is fair and best. And it feels like, at least with the, some of the conversations that I've heard, this is what the schools want. Instead of screwing around with all of the stuff outside the collectives and it, is this on the up and up? Is it not? How are we going to handle this with, with our donor base? All of that. It's, it's a nightmare to try and navigate. It, it'd be better if they could just take it all in-house and deal with it that way and set up some guidelines that that schools have to follow and let's see how they would police that you know and regulate that between themselves but um it it feels like that's the direction this thing has been and frankly needs to go and i'm sure you you could rein in some of the portal stuff and some of the the NIL stuff and and i don't mean rein in as in dollar amounts, I mean, just get some legitimacy behind some of these deals that have gone on uh, where we've heard where guys have signed deals and not getting gotten paid or, or whatever has gone on. It seems like the best way to go about it. Now, there's going to be a lot of pushback on this. A lot. Because you have to understand, College football, like, for example, Oklahoma moving to the SEC is a big move. We're going to make more money for the athletic department going to the SEC with the payout, right? It's, it's you know, I don't know how many more millions of dollars. But that's not the real reason behind the move. That money is this compared to, to enrollment whenever you get into one of those big conferences and you have an explosion of, of football and you have success, what that does to your enrollment, that is where the real money is. And when you make a dividing line between subdivision A, where the big boys play, and subdivision B, where the big boys don't play, that enrollment in these schools down here is going to go boom. And the schools up here is going to go boom. So there, in my opinion, there's going to be a big fight as to like whether or not they should do this, who's going to be in, how many teams, like, you know what I'm saying? Like that, that to me is the interesting part about it. Yeah. I, I think that this is clear. It's not a final product, right? But it's a hell of a conversation starter. I love it. I'm I'm with you and because the current system, it's I mean, it's a bit of a mess. It's stupid. Yeah. So how can we get some more structure for the schools, for the players? Like the schools being able to handle NIL stuff for the players, that's how I believe it should have been from the start. Because the schools have that built in infrastructure. I love the trust fund part of it too. And I don't know how that works, but to where you make money and it goes over here and whenever you're done, boom, you're out the door with your, your pile. I, the only question I have about it is the title nine aspect of the trust fund. That that's where it's interesting to me because will they, when you look at the fund, 
is is it going to be equal money to male athletes and female athletes? Do equal numbers of the athletes have to get paid, but the amount can be different? Because when you look at it, the revenue is being produced for most places, not all, but most football and men's basketball. So that's where I, I'm confused. Like how are how are the revenue producing sports, for lack of a ber- better better term, gonna get theirs? Is that gonna come in the NIL piece through schools? That's where that's where the Title IX implications on the trust fund and how that will be distributed distributed. It feels a little unclear to me. And I read from multiple people. I read multiple articles. They're like, not exactly sure how that whole thing would work from a Title IX aspect. I'm not sure how it work either, but it's stupid that it's even a conversation. This is not what Title IX was intended for. It's just not. It has nothing to do with the original intention of Title IX. I, when you have a football program that brings in hundreds of millions of dollars. No one would have ever or would now suggest that the the softball team or the soccer team should get the same pay as the football team. I mean, it's just like, no. Like, they exist because of the football team in most places. Not in all of them, but in most of the places that are going to be jumping into this subdivision that we're talking about, it's this is professional sports. It has nothing to do with Title IX. Title IX is like, it's for federal funding. Like, if you're going to get federal funding, you need to check these boxes to where it's equal for your, your male and female students. Like, that's where this originally came from is for students. Like, we're talking, this is professional football. I mean, right? Yeah. I mean that's professional football. This is in Title Nine. It it feels like the groundwork towards a professional football league. Right. Is how yeah. it feels. Mm-hmm. But just a really big one. <laughs> yeah. Just a you know, 65, 70 team but minor take, league football league. Your question is important because uh the wrong application of a rule that was never intended for anything like this can keep something like this from happening. Yeah. And that's where I think, uh, I think that's going to be a hurdle, but I'm really interested to see where this goes. I think the good thing for me, for you, for the vast majority of people that listen to this podcast is we know OU is going to be in this subdivision. Yeah. Yep. So whatever it ends up looking like, we all could just sit here and go, okay, let's see what this thing ends up looking like. We know the Sooners are in. So there's some people out there looking at this reporting today going, oh my God, are we going to, are we going to pony up to be in this thing or not? Can we like, what is that number? Like they talked about a number that you have to get to, to set aside each year, right? $30,000 per year per athlete into a quote enhanced educational trust fund for at least half the school's countable athletes. Okay. It, I saw some figures that, you know, you're looking at somewhere from five to $7 million a year in that pot. So. I don't know, man. I, I personally, I, I think it's, I think it's, I think it's wild that it, it, think about what this does to other sports. Like, cause if you're a team that is like thinking about getting in to this subdivision, like you want to get in, I, it's going to be difficult financially to do that. And your football team is going to have to subsidize $30,000 per athlete for some of these other sports that are not, they don't produce any revenue at all. It's a drain on the athletic department budget. You know what happens to that? Like if you want to be in the subdivision, 
gone. Everything but football, gone instantly. If you if you don't pay in, like if you can't keep your head above water, gone for a lot of schools. If it's like that's the like the little I know, that seems like the decision to get in, right? It's like Yeah, that's that's why the trust fund piece of it and how Title IX will work with it and how that will be distributed. That's the biggest question that I that I had after I read through these proposals. Mm-hmm. So we'll see, but I do think we're moving. This is yeah, this is positive stuff from the NCAA. Are we complimenting them? What's happening? Hey, uh, give it up to Charlie Baker. He took over a rudderless ship that had been like floating around, banging up against the rocks. <laughs> Everyone <laughs> drunk and passed out aboard. And uh, he's actually, I don't know that. I don't know that he's got the thing back online, but he's built a rudder at least. <laughs> it hadn't been it hadn't been put in the water yet, but there's at least a sketch of a rudder. I would pay money to see Mark Emmer reading the, the first article about this. <laughs> do you think it was like pretty good idea? Why didn't I think of that? Or do you think you just read? He's <laughs> like that is the stupidest thing I've ever heard of. This is amateur athletics. No, hadn't been for a long time. <laughs> yeah. All right. For my loser of the week, Ted, I thought about going with us. Our guy, Big Game Boomer, put out his list of top college football media personalities for the 2023 season, and neither of us made it. <sighs> Shame. I consider- we considering- suck. Who he had is number one. I consider not making that list a badge of honor. Yeah, Brandon Walker was letting everyone know that he was number one. God. Oh, that guy's wildly entertaining to me. But I think he's like the dumbest person in all of sports entertainment. But, you know, he pay, he plays a role for some people. Yeah. You know? Yeah, no doubt. Let's just move on. <laughs> It is funny he ended up with an OU coach as their head coach. That's amazing. That was legit. Fantastic. All right, my loser of the week. Give me the Jacksonville Jaguars. Mm. Monday Night Football was great. That was an awesome game back and forth. Very insane. But for the Jags, you get carved up by Jake Browning. Trevor Lawrence, your offensive tackle gets bowled into Trevor Lawrence and stomps his ankle into a high ankle sprain. He can barely get to the locker room. Where was the cart, by the way? What are we doing? And he, he was like, the funny part was Trevor Lawrence was pissed. He was like looking for a flag. He's like, what did that guy just do to me? He thought it was the defender. <laughs> and, and he he gets rolled up by his own lineman who stomps his ankle into a high ankle sprain. And then the defensive lineman keeps going through the guy and bends him over. I know it was oh. bad. So that's a night. If you, that's about it. That's your nightmare. If you're an offensive tackle right there, Walker little was like, uh, get me out of here. <laughs> but the, you get carved up by Jake Browning. Your starting quarterback gets a high ankle sprain. And then you lose in overtime. Not great for your former employer, Ted. No. Oh, Jake Browning? I I thought that was Joe Burrow out there carving <laughs> well, up the, the Jaguars. Well, if you, you – and I know you watched. You, you clearly knew it wasn't <laughs> Joe Burrow because the camera was on him like 50% of the game. Yeah. How many yeah. shots of Joe Burrow do we need? Yeah, he keeps he, getting more he, handsome, though. So that good for you, Joe. Hmm? Jake Brownie was dropping some bombs out there. He played really, really good football. He, and I thought Zach Taylor did a really nice job of getting him on the move. Mm-hmm. And that's something that has gone away, had gone away a little bit from that Cincinnati offense because of Burrow's leg situation. Yeah. You know, he had had to play pretty much just static from the pocket for the most part, especially early in the season when it, it was clear he wasn't even close to right. Yeah, you go back to, like, even at LSU, he was best whenever he made the first guy miss, got out there, and just was would whip it down the field. That's a good point. But, yeah, Browning, 32 of 37, 354, 
a passing touchdown and a rushing touchdown. Mm, 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 and mm. you know how I know he's smart? He threw it to Jamar Chase a lot. Dang. Yeah, I never would have thought of doing that. 11 for 149 for Jamar Chase. And and he had that one hit him in the chest, and he caught the very next ball and let them know about it afterwards because they were talking to him whenever yeah. he dropped it. That was awesome. And that Joe Mixon guy continues to be very good at football. Guy uh, looks co- good out there, doesn't he? Couple touchdowns for Mixon. The maybe the most entertaining play of the game, the Tyler Boyd double pass interception. Have you ever seen anything that bad? Uh yeah, well, I just need to go back and review some uh some Brock Purdy film from Iowa State. I could probably find something. I I re rewound, rewinded, rewound. Was I it watched worse than that the Gordon double pass? Dude, it was worse than that. He threw it straight to a defensive lineman in the backfield. What was that? I've never seen that. Like, okay, uh, yeah, you throw it down the field. You make an awful decision. Okay, but it looked like he saw him and just threw it right into his chest. I've never, I don't think I've ever seen that happen on a trick play. It's crazy. Dude, I just can't. It's crazy to think that we had Joe Mixon, Samaj P. Ryan, Mark Andrews, like all of those guys on one team. CD Lamb. <laughs> Isn't that insane? We've got, uh, don't bring up the Rose Bowl, man. Don't do it. I know. I know it. What'd you Crazy. think of the all white jerseys for the Bengals? In or out? I, I liked it because they, they they didn't have their normal helmet. They had the white helmet too, right? White helmet. Yeah, it was all it was white head to toe. I would have loved it if it was their original helmet. I agree. I thought that was a mistake. And I kind of I'm starting to develop your thought process on that. It took me a second a couple of times where I was like, wait, who is it? when you have that tiger stripe, that orange helmet. I instantly know yep. it's the Bengals. I kind of love Jaguars all black. Yeah. Good look. It's hard to it's hard to screw up all black for That's a football true. uniform. Yeah. But great game. We'll see what Trevor Lawrence's status is moving forward. That did not look good. God, he was in a lot of pain. So lot. many of the quarterbacks are hurt in the NFL. Not good. Not I thought I couldn't see it at first. I thought with the way he kind of first reacted i thought it was an achilles tear Oof, don't say that because he did the thing where he looked like he was kind of okay but he was looking back you know like when people tear their achilles they think someone kicked him or something from behind yeah. and he like he tried to get up and walk on it too and then just went right down to the ground i was like oh no not again but it's just a horrible high ankle sprain. That's it. <laughs> it's just the worst injury for your ankle. Oh, we'll see. Kind of in the final stretch, of the NFL season. Getting, getting I close. Know. It kind of came out of nowhere. I know. All right. Birthday shout outs. Happy 25th birthday to Dawson Fleek. Happy 26th birthday to John Toomey. Happy 34th birthday to Patrick Coach Rowdy Winter Road. Happy 40th birthday to Nikoli Dibolchikov. Try it one more time. Say it with more confidence. Nikolai? Yeah, what I say? Nikoli. <laughs> Nikoli? It could be. I should have I like read ahead on this one. Nikolai Dibolchikov. Nailed it. Happy 42nd birthday to David Boomer Balak Baluk Balak B A L U K Balak Baluk. It's got to be one or the other. Balak. I don't know. I'm sorry. I'm sorry, David Boomer. I tried, man. Well, it gets worse. <laughs> Happy 71st birthday to John Wickerbrot. I'm going 
happy 71st birthday to John Weikbrot. Ah, uh, yeah, Weikbrot. Yeah, Mike Brot. Right. I think uh, it's Brot. John we, John White wrote. <laughs> we haven't battled. We haven't battled like this in a while. This is, this feels like a throwback session of birthday shout outs. Last one. Happy birthday. All of these I've never seen these last last names in my entire life. <laughs> no. Sometimes I think people are just method with us. Happy birthday to Crystal Eaton. And thanks for having an easy name, Crystal. Thank no, you. <laughs> On that note, episode 377 in the books. We'll have a new podcast that'll drop on Sunday. Just a reminder, you can hear Teddy from 3 to 6 on The Ref. You can hear me from 2 to 5 on Sirius XM Big 12 Radio, Channel 375. Hope you all have a fantastic rest of your week. Have an awesome weekend. I don't know what we're going to do without college football, but we'll figure it out together. And until next time, we appreciate you all for listening. Do what you always do, Oklahoma. Take care of each other.